morning. I'm Pastor Steve, and I want to welcome everyone to First Church this morning. A special welcome to those who are joining us online today. We're so glad you're with us. This morning, we will be celebrating communion. And so for those of you joining us online, um, you, you want to take a moment and, and, and get some juice uh, and some bread in preparation for the Lord's Supper today. And at this time, I'm going to invite you all to please stand. We're going to begin by lifting our voices up in praise to the Lord.
this morning, Lord, and we just pray. Lord, that is our prayer this morning, that we would believe that you would conquer the fear that is within us, the doubts and the worries, the concerns of the world that we might have that are in our lives, and, and that we would believe and put our trust in you. And so this morning, Lord, as we gather to hear your word, we just ask God that you would speak, that your spirit would move, and that we would hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Brothers and sisters, you've been gathered here on this day, not by chance, but through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to invite you to take a moment and to greet one another with the love of Christ as, as you just share a greeting and share a little love. Just calling a few things out to your attention. Uh, there's a, an update, a communication page in your bulletin sharing some of the things that God is doing here in our church. Um, I'm excited. Uh, the building team has, has done some amazing work and, and they have um, the architects. I mean, some of you have received surveys, most of you. I um, just want to encourage you to please fill those out and get them back as soon as possible. Um, as they would like to have them back by Monday. Um, and then also, we're going to be having a fireman's dinner on the 20th, Saturday. And, and I'm going to turn it over to Joe, because Joe is doing all, all the hard work. And uh, you know, he's got just to share a little bit, if you would, Joe. Well, we're expecting roughly 400 people. Might have to just tilt it up, Joe. Just take it out and use it. New microphones. Here we go. New microphones, exactly. Yeah, wow. All right, we're expecting about 400 guests that Saturday, so um, it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of work from everybody here. What we need is we need helpers for setup. We need helpers to serve the food, to carry the food from the kitchen out to the tables. Uh, we're going to be going through a lot of food real fast. So. Uh, definitely gonna need some help there. If anyone has any of the drink coolers, like the five gallon coolers, um, we're looking for four or five of those to be able to keep up with the people. Um, if anyone has any cornhole games you'd be willing to bring, let them use that day. We'll give them an opportunity to get outside and fellowship there too. And uh, we're really looking forward to the event. So uh, there's sign ups out back for pretty much everything. We need people table decorations. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, it's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be a lot of fun, and it's going to give us a chance to thank those guys that not only gave it for over there, but give it every day to keep us all safe. So. Exactly. Well, thank you, Joe, for that. So if any of you are, are um, would be willing to help, um, you know, I think we, we should probably gather right after the service or sign-up sheets there, um, get with Joe and Judy, 
um, and, and we'll meet in the back after worship um, just to do some of the planning and, and, and work some things out. Um, but just uh, you know, think about it, 21 fire departments, 150 firemen, and not one of them was hurt by God's grace. And, and they fought that fire for over 19 hours. And so we're just, we're inviting them to come back with their families. Um, they'll get to see the site cleaned up for the most part and, and, and the movement that has been going on there. And, and so we're excited for that. Um, and, and so just, you know, continue to give thanks to God. If you um, can help or maybe you know somebody, it, it just doesn't have to be people from our church. There's been many in the community have said they would love to help. I mean, here's a chance to invite them to come and, and give a hand. Um, because as Joe said, we're going to need a lot of workers. And, 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 and that's, a, that's a pretty cool thing. So this time I want to invite you. Um, we're going to um, turn and we're going to go into God's Word. You know, here, here's a saying. It's, it says that faith is the reality of what we hope for. The proof of what we don't see. And the elders in the past were approved because they showed faith. And yet, I don't know about you, in the world today, um, you know, we're faced with a lot of um, worry and anxiety. And today's sermon is entitled, Ravens and the Question of Why. And, and some of the questions um, that, that, you know, strike me as, I don't know, you know, I think about even last week's sermon is, you know, why did that rich man build all those barns? And we talked about that a little bit, but we're going to say a little bit more today. And, and then here's, you know, other questions that we have, you know, today in the, in the world today. It, it's like, why, why does God refer to ravens in today's text in, in, in Luke that we're going to read? And then the big one, why do we worry? Because Paul in his letter to Hebrews says, you know what, why do you worry? And, and Jesus says, why do you worry? Don't be anxious. I think about that and I go, I, I can't always answer that question, but I know that, you know, two nights ago I, I couldn't get to sleep. I don't know about you, have you ever had one of those nights where the brain just gets going and your mind's spinning and you can't shut it down? I think we all know what I'm talking about. We've all had those moments where, you know, and it may be a little worry, it may be a big worry, it may be a big fear, it may be something we're anxious about, and, 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 and we're all stressed out. And the mind just doesn't shut down. And I, I would tell you, church and friends, that, that we live in a, a, a world, a worried world. And, and anxiety is high in the world today around us. Anxiety, if you were to look it up, it, it, it says that anxiety is a feeling of worry, nervousness, unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. I think about it. How often do we worry? And the reality is there's nothing we can do to change things. So today, you know, we're going to turn to the Gospel of Luke, and, and I'm going to invite my brother Paul to come up. But think about these words that he's going to read this morning. In light of the rich man who, while his barns were full, when he was faced with an abundant crop, he worried about what he was going to do with that crop, and what did he do? He tore the barns that he had down, and he built bigger ones so that he might relax and, and take it easy. And, and, and so this man was beset with anxiety about what he was going to do. And Jesus goes on, he's got a word to say about that today, and I'm going to let Paul share that with you this morning. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, beginning with the 22nd verse. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, 
and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than the birds. Who of you are worrying? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the, clothes the grass of the field, which is here today to, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your Father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no mouth destroys. For where your treasure is, treasure is, there your heart will also be. Thank you, Paul. And then I want to invite us to turn to Paul's letter to the Hebrews. We're going to turn to the 11th chapter this morning. And Paul is talking about faith. And so these two texts that we're listening to this morning are about how much do we trust God. And, and it could be said that in the midst of all our fears and worries, some people say, well, you just don't have any faith. And I go, no, I'm human. I'm human. I have my doubts. I have my fears. I have my concerns. I know God's got it. But sometimes I need a reminder, just like anybody else. Listen to these words. Paul is writing at the end of the chapter of Hebrews, and he says, By faith, Abraham had called to go to a place where he would receive as his inheritance. He would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed, and went even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Now, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. And therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he was preparing a city for them. Here ends this reading from the book that we love. Thanks be to God. So I talked and introduced this sermon today with the, you know, talking about anxiety and worry and, and stress. And in this rich man, he builds his barns, but he did it, Jesus says, out of anxiousness. And that's a piece that sometimes we forget because we read the parable and we stop. We read the story and we stop. And this idea that, you know, we're not to be anxious today. 
And so the question, you know, these questions, why did the rich man build barns? Why does Jesus refer to ravens in this story to remind us that, you know, we can trust him? And then why do we worry? Why do we stay up at night with our minds spinning? And, and, and Jesus says, don't be anxious. Paul says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Consider Abraham and Sarah. In, in, in this idea of, of faith, you know, we miss this reality that, you know, Abraham was called to go where he didn't know. I think about that today, you know, so often we're called to go and enter into and head towards something that we don't know. And sometimes we do it well and sometimes we do it filled with anxiety and fear. The late Martin Luther King, near the end of his life, said, I no longer am optimistic, but I'm hopeful. I think as Christians, we're called to be hopeful because we put our trust in Jesus Christ. But truth be told, sometimes that's difficult. What does it mean to be optimistic and hopeful in the world we live in? What does it mean to be optimistic and hopeful in the face of what's going on in our lives? Maybe you're waiting for answers. How do you remain hopeful? Maybe you've had tests done and the prognosis might not be what you hoped for. Maybe you're waiting for a child expectantly, but there's still the stress and anxiety. Will the child be born or will the child come and, and, and will there be any challenges? All the things that we worry about. Maybe you're looking to change jobs or you're starting a new job and you're anxious and you're worried about, man, am I gonna like this place? Is the boss gonna be good? Maybe you're facing an uncertainty in the future and you're having to wait. Christopher Lash writes, he says, optimism believes that things will get better tomorrow. Hope is ready if things don't get better. Optimism is up to us doing better. Notice it's up to us. Hope, listen to this, hope depends on God. And so this idea that faith and trust in God is, is a conviction in things not seen, for what is seen is invisible. What is not seen is invisible is that trust. This morning I said you were gathered here through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the question. Could any of you see that spirit this morning? Did you feel it this morning when you got up and got dressed? Nudging you along to come? And some of you are going, yeah, I saw it. And I go, no, I don't see it, but I feel it. I know it. There are lots of unseen things in the future, in the world around us, in our lives, but, but our future is secure if we put our trust in God. Our future is secure. Hebrews reminds us this morning that, you know what, when Abraham was called, he went. You notice he didn't sit and wait, he went. He didn't wait for the travel agent or somebody to give him an itinerary or a map. He went. He went towards an uncertain future, an unknown future. He went. God in, in Genesis 12 tells Abraham to go. And, and where does he go? God says, don't worry about it. I'm sending you to a place I will show you. I got to tell you something. If God's got a place for you, and he's got a place for every one of us here this morning, every one of us listening, a place that we're called to be, a place that we're called to engage, if he's got a place to go, 
He wants us to know that it'll be far better than the ravens. You know, Paul talks about the ravens in Hebrew, and he says, you know, why do you worry? God takes care of the ravens, right? They have food, they have um, all that they need. And won't he do so much more for you who he loves and created even more? He made them and he takes care of them. He made you and he takes care of us. Jesus tells his, calls his disciples to go. Do any of you remember where he called his disciples to go? When he called Peter, James, and John? Did he give them a map of what they were going to do the next three years? Did he tell them how many miles they were going to end up walking? I don't think so, because I think if he had, Peter, James, and John would have said, you know, um, Jesus, I don't think so. I got my comfortable boat, my comfortable home, I got my comfortable job, I think I'm going to stay put. No, he simply said, come, follow me. Come, follow me. And so I think about that and I go, how are we doing with our anxieties and our fears and our worries? I want to remind you of what Jesus said. All your worries won't add one minute to your day or to your life. Not one minute. In fact, it's a pretty proven fact medically that the more we worry, the more we stress out about things, the more we do that, the shorter our life will be. The shorter it will be. And I'm sitting here going, okay, Lord, I don't know my day or time, but you know what? I don't need to add to that. And yet, here's the truth. Especially in the last four months, I worry. I'm a worrier. And ever since the fire, I probably worry more. And, and yet I sit here and, and I know it and I believe it and I hold on to that hope that I know God's got this. Right? Amen? Amen. Now a little louder. Amen? Amen. Amen? God's got this. But I still worry. As a parent, I still worry about my kids. They're growing up. They're doing great. I still worry. And I don't, I'm, not, I'm now a grandparent, and, and you know, it's too soon to ask me this question, but, but I just wonder, grandparents, do you, when your kids yeah. are still worry when they're older and your grandkids are older, do you still worry? I'm not quite there yet. Elijah's not even one, but, but we worry. Here's the other thing about faith. Faith is about going and moving in spite of our fears and our worries. Abraham went, Paul says in Hebrews. Sarah, she didn't believe, but she didn't hold back. Faith isn't about, Father Boyle says, he writes, faith isn't about saluting a set of beliefs, it's about walking with Jesus and being a companion particularly standing in the lowly place with the easily despised and readily left out in the world around us. And his model of how to be in ministry, he writes about being in ministry with gang members and how he strived to transform a violent society in which he was called to minister. Abraham knows no city and Sarah had no fertility in her womb and yet look at what God did. Look at what God did. Reinhold Niebuhr writes, nothing worth doing can be accomplished in a single lifetime so we're saved by hope. So nothing with all of our worries can be accomplished but as long as we get up and we go out and we do, we can do far more than we can ever imagine. And so Jesus is saying to you and I today, 
hey, you know what? I need you to stop worrying and cast your fears and your cares on me. I need you to trust. I need you to believe. Here's this reality. Some of us think that the Christian life is simply about believing. And Marcus Borg, in, in his famous his book on this topic about faith, he writes, until my late 30s, I, I saw the Christian life as being primarily about believing. And like so many of us, he writes, as a child, I had no problem with belief. But then he goes on to say, at the end of childhood, there began a period in his life that lasted 20 years in which he struggled with doubt and disbelief. And all through this period, he writes, I continue to think that believing was what the Christian life was about. I just had to believe in Jesus Christ and everything would be fine. And he writes, yet no matter how hard I tried, I was unable to do that. And I wondered how others could. I'm sure you've known some saints and in spite of everything that's gone on in their life, they have this just immovable faith. And you go, how did they do it? He writes, now I no longer see the Christian life as being primarily about believing. The experiences of my mid-30s led me to realize that God is and that the central issue of the Christian life is not believing in God. Listen to this church. It's not believing in God or believing in the Bible or believing in Christian tradition, but rather, he writes, the Christian life is about entering into a relationship with that to which the Christian tradition points, which may be spoken of as God, the risen, living Jesus Christ, or the Spirit. And as a Christian, and a Christian, he writes, as one who lives out their relationship with God. I think faith and what we're talking about today, this fear and this anxiety that led the rich man to build bigger barns so that he could ensure his future instead of saying, you know what, I'm going to put my trust in God and I'm going to share what I've been given in abundance with the world around us because I know God's going to take care of tomorrow. Something we struggle with. That's what he's talking about there. If we live out our relationship with God, the world's going to know it and they're going to see it. And we're going to be able to tell them because hopefully they'll ask, man, how do you get through those valleys? How do you continue to say you believe? And my answer to them is because I know that God is the one thing in this world that I can trust on without question because He is the yesterday, He is the beginning, He's the Alpha and the Omega. He will be here today and He's here tomorrow. The sun's going to be there, the world's going to be there around us, and God is with us. <coughs> and I can hold on to that. Even in the midst of being honest about my doubts and saying I struggle and I have moments. But the one thing that I know absolutely is that he's going to be there. And so here's the, you know, the question today. What are the worries that you have? And I would invite you to write them down. You could take your outlines and hand this room. And, and I would invite you to not only just write them down, but I invite you to name them and then turn them over to God. Now, does that mean at that moment you'll never worry about that again? Nope. But you begin to do that again and again, and I think you begin to build the trust and understanding of who God is and His faithfulness and that He's got it. And each day that you do that, it begins to get easier. And at some point in your life, somebody's going to look at you and go, how do you do it? How is it that you have such faith and trust in God in the face of all that has gone on in your life and all that is going on around us? 
And I think that's the point where you can tell them, it's because I've got this more than just belief. I've got this faith and trust. I've got a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And for that we say, thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, God, and I'm just so thankful, Lord, for your word this morning. Lord, we live in a world full of worries and fears. Is the market up or down? Am I going to be able to pay the bills this week? Am I going to last in this job? Am I going to be able to get a job? Will we be our children safe? Are they going to come home tonight? All those things, Lord, I think about it. I think about all the teachers, Lord, that are preparing for the beginning of school and all the kids that are coming. How about those kids that are going to be entering a building for the first time? Maybe they're freshmen in the high school or they're entering the middle school for the first time or they're going off to elementary school for the first time. And Lord, we pray. I pray for the children, for the parents, for all those who are struggling and wrestling with fears and anxiety and worry, Lord, because we confess, God, that what you call upon us to trust you, that that we easily fall back into old habits and patterns and that we do have fears and that we do have doubts. Forgive us, Lord. Give us the strength that we need, the courage to to put our trust not in in new barns and new things and in, in, in our bank accounts and our jobs and our the money and the things that we can do of our hands, but rather, Lord, help us to put our trust in you. And when we fall short, Lord, when we fail, forgive us. Give us that courage. The courage that saw Abraham go off to a new land. The courage that saw disciples get up and leave all that they had and follow you, Jesus. Help us to do that today. And if we haven't made that commitment, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that your spirit would move in us and and you would give us that longing and that desire to know you and to walk with you. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. This morning we have the privilege of of coming to the Lord's table. and, And I want you to stop and just think about the table today in light of the text and the words that we've just listened to. You see, this table... We come to it, and we, when we talk about the Lord's Supper and coming and taking communion, we, we talk about the fact that we come to it and we remember. We remember Jesus Christ. We remember what He did for us, that He came and He walked on this earth, that He died on the cross, and that He rose again on that third day so that we might receive forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. And I think about this table today and I go, you know what, in the midst of the bread and the wine, we're being reminded that God's got this. That God's got you and me. And that He's here. We're reminded of God's unbelievable love for each of us and His His incredible grace. And so this morning as we come to the table, we remember that on that last supper with his disciples, Jesus took the wine. And as he poured it out, he said to his disciples, as often as you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. As often as you come to the table, 
and you take the Lord's Supper and you drink this cup, remember me. In the same fashion, at the end, at, during the meal, but I've switched the order this morning. Um, he took the bread at the beginning of the meal. He took, did the cup at the end. In the same fashion, he also took the bread. And when he broke it, he, he said to his disciples, you know what? This is my body and it's broken for you. Notice that it's broken. Jesus hung on that cross broken for you and I. He died for you and I. And he rose again. And so when we come to this table, we remember that Jesus takes what is broken and he makes it whole again. He's the only one that can do that. And so today, if you're joining us online and if you're with us here today and, and you are broken as we all are, know that Jesus Christ wants you to come and enter into a relationship with him because he alone can take that which is broken in the world and make it and restore it and make it whole again. And so brothers and sisters, we're going to, this morning, we're going to take communion in, in the traditional way. We're going to pass the elements um, and I'm going to invite the elders to come forward at this time. While they're doing so, just a word of instruction. Um, in the center of the plates of bread are cups, and in those cups are gluten-free wafers for those of you that are gluten intolerant. And so now come, for all who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ, this table is now ready. Brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ, broken for you. Take, eat, and believe.
Brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ shed for you. Take, drink, and believe. reading bless the Lord O my soul bless the Lord O my soul who forgives all your iniquity who redeems your life from the pit The Lord is merciful and gracious. He does not deal with us according to our sins. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the steadfast love of as far as the east is from the west, so far as you are transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, and will also give us all things with him. Father, we come before you today, God, so thankful for the gift you have given us in your Son, Jesus Christ, for the fullness of your grace and love for us, for this table that we have gathered around, a reminder of that love and that grace, for the gift of your word, Lord, on this day, and the movement and the power of your Spirit. God, as we prepare to go out into the world this coming week, Lord, we just pray that we too might go as Abraham went, that we too might go out and in the midst of our doubts and fears that we might go out with the rock at our feet, knowing full well that you are with us not only today, but tomorrow and forever, and that you will sustain us. May we go forward boldly, even when we feel that we're, we're not so bold. And may you do, Lord, immeasurably more than we can ever imagine, for that is what you do. We ask this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I want to invite the praise team to come forward. If you're joining us online today, this is the time when you have the opportunity to, to give back to the Lord just a, a portion of what He has so abundantly given us. And so the 
deacons, I would like to invite them to come forward and to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. So we just pray, God, that you would take these gifts and multiply them, that you would multiply the gifts you have given each of us so that we might use them for your sake and for your kingdom in this community and the world around us. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, as we prepare to go from this place, receive the parting blessing. I invite you to hold out your hands. May God go before you to guide you. May, go, may He go behind you to protect you. And may God go beneath you to support you and beside you to befriend you. And be not afraid, but let the blessing of the Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, descend upon you, settle in around you, and make its home in you. Be not afraid, but go in peace. Amen. And now praise team, send us home. Here's something a little different. Thank you.